So this week in Learning to Light, the last proper lesson before I conclude everything next week, we've got the final of our real world lighting scenarios, this time mixing daylight with flash. Right, now we can start to get a bit clever. We're going to try mixing different light sources. Uh, we're out here on an absolutely freezing day in February. We obviously have the ambient light, uh, the daylight, what there is of it, which isn't much. But we also have, as you can see, a flash and another flash down the back there. Now, of course, we can use one light or the other. We can shoot with just ambient or we can shoot with just flash. Or we can combine the two, as you'll see, to create certain effects. Let's see what happens. So let's start by looking at our setup. The general outline is pretty familiar to us now. We've got a softbox on the front of a battery powered flash head in front of and to Lisa's left. And then behind her on her right, we've got another battery powered flash head with a zoom reflector on aiming back at her. The camera is on a tripod with a radio trigger attached. And of course, we're outside in pretty grotty daylight rather than the studio. Now, as a quick note, I'm using the battery flash heads in this instance, as of course they don't need to be plugged in, and I can move them around outside with ease. Now we've touched on the concept of mixing light sources before. Remember we shot that globe on the table, and by varying the shutter speed we were able to affect how light or dark the rest of the shot was, whilst keeping the globe consistent. The same sort of things will be at work here, but I want to finesse them a little and add a couple of new elements. Here's an image with no flashlight straight out of the camera. The exposure is 1 15th of a second, f2.8 at ISO 100. It looks fine if a little flat. Lisa's eyes are a little dark and the only thing separating her from the environment is the shallow depth of field. Now let's turn our flashes on. Now to keep things simple, I'm not going to detail exactly what power these flashes are on, nor change them from shot to shot. They're simply set to give me a correct exposure at f2.8. Remember, flash exposure isn't affected by shutter speed until we go faster than the maximum sync speed. Immediately, we can see that adding the flash has lifted the shadows in Lisa's face, but it's not had any effect on the buildings and alleyway behind. Now let's adjust the shutter speed, which will only affect the parts of the image lit by the ambient light. First, let's speed up by one stop to 1 30th of a second. Lisa's still looking good, and the rest of the shot is now starting to look a bit darker. Now another stop down to 1 60th of a second. Lisa is still well lit, although she looks subtly darker, but the rest of the scene now looks as if night has fallen. Go another stop to 1 125th, and even further to 150th of a second, and the effect becomes even more marked. If we go past 1 250th of a second, we'll start to see black bands across the frame, as you can see here with the shutter speed at 1 500th of a second. We've now exceeded the maximum synchronization speed of the flash, and since I've not turned on the very clever high speed sync mode in these Profoto flashes, that's as far as we can take it. I just want to stress that as I've altered the shutter speed, I haven't adjusted the flash power at all. It has stayed the same each time. Remember, the pulse of a flash is so brief that the length of time the shutter is open for has almost no effect on it. So in a scene like this, where there are areas lit by flash and by ambient continuous light, you can effectively have two different exposures, an ambient and a flash, and adjust them as you choose to create the effect you want. Now, I want to delve a little deeper and examine why Lisa got a little darker when we made the shutter speed faster, despite her being lit by the flash. In a scene like this, even though we think the ambient and the flash as being two distinct things, and we can control them separately, the fact is, Lisa is lit by both to some extent. That ambient light is always present until you underexpose it so much that only the flash is having any effect. This is why, as we speed the shutter speed up, the light on Lisa's face changes as she becomes more and more dependent on the flash to light her. You can see the main thing the ambient light is doing is lifting the shadows. Now you must bear this in mind when mixing light sources. Think carefully about which light is doing what. Don't be afraid to check the back of the camera and fine tune things as you go along. Now in this shot, if I wanted a really dark, moody image, but still wanted to keep a bit more light on Lisa's face, it would probably help to add a reflector to lift those shadows that start to appear as the shutter speeds up. 
Using flash in a situation like this gives us yet another chance to explore inverse square law, although I expect you're sick of hearing about it by now. Let's switch from the initial ambient only shot to the darkest of the lot at 1 250th of a second. Now watch how not only do the ambient parts of the image darken down, but Lisa seems to be almost cut out against the environment. Now this is clearly a byproduct of inverse square law. If we expose correctly for Lisa, there's no way the light from the softbox flash near the camera will be able to expose the walls of a building 100 feet behind her. Now in one obvious sense, this is the entire point of the shot. We're trying to focus attention on her and create drama, but you can easily take this too far. A shot like this can very quickly become just a body on a very dark background, and that might be your intention, but it usually makes sense to keep some of the environment visible. You also need to be aware what your lights are capable of. Now we were quite lucky that the day we shot on was overcast. That meant the flashes didn't have to work very hard to overpower the amount of daylight. On a bright sunny day, they would have worked harder. The addition of a softbox might have knocked too much power out of that front light, for example. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have been able to achieve this darkening down effect without changing the modifier to something else. As with everything else we've covered, all the four characteristics of light interact and play out on the image we're trying to create. I'm afraid there is no escaping them, but now you know so much about them, you can approach a shot like this with a great deal of confidence. One last detail. Flare. Look at the left hand side of the frame and there's a distinctly bright area. Now I left this in as an example. Strictly speaking it shouldn't be there, but I quite like it and it's a good excuse to talk about it. I mentioned flare briefly when putting a shot together piece by piece, but it's worth going into a bit more detail. The definition of flare is non-image forming light, and it's caused by light looking straight into the lens, backlighting as we've encountered a few times. Usually it will reduce the contrast in a shot, and taken to extremes it'll be pretty much all you can see. A little dab of it here and there can be quite effective though, just use it sparingly. Backlighting in this way will also show up anything in the air between the light and the camera. So if you're trying to make dust, rain, smoke or powder look dramatic, you'll want to backlight it in some way. Look closely at the flare area in this shot and you'll see fine drops of rain because not only was it freezing but it was also drizzling too. She's a real pro that Lisa. To fine tune flare you simply need to carefully control the angle and fall of light from any lights that are pointing towards the camera. In this instance, our backlight has a zoom reflector on, and it's zoomed in pretty tight to keep the spill of light down. To reduce the flare further, I could angle it away from the camera and more onto Lisa, I could add a modifier like a grid, or I could place a flag somewhere between the light and the camera. You can also control it to some extent by altering the quantity of light. If I turned the power of this light down, you'd see less flare, but of course you'd also see less light on Lisa. Now an important question to ask as we wrap all this up is why bother doing all of this? There's already light outside, so why complicate things by bringing flashes in? Well, look at the difference between the original daylight only shot and the finished flash shot. I think you'll agree the shot with flash has distinctly more impact, doesn't it? It also focuses our attention much more on Lisa rather than being a photograph of Lisa and a back alley. The first shot is just fine and would suit some applications, but the lit version is definitely more interesting and more people are likely to look at it. That, really, is the secret of why we learn how to light. So we can employ all these various tools, techniques and equipment to create images that make us happy and excited and that people will want to look at. OK, hopefully that illustrated an awful lot of the key topics I've been talking about over and over again throughout the past nearly six months of this course. Next week I've got a quick conclusion for you where we kind of bring everything together and set you on your way to a lifetime of lighting better in your photography.